the first thing I'm going to say is that um, for me as a developer, uh, I would say probably, if I'm completely honest with you, I'll probably prefer the uh, first couple of Bitcoin conferences where it was like a few people in a small room, you know, not as intimidating um, as everyone suited up and, and ready to go. Um, but I'll do my very best. Um, right now, I'm working at Ripple, uh, as Premier mentioned. And uh, uh, overall, the way the, the Bitcoin space is going, it's, uh, it's absolutely exciting to, to be a part of it. Um, I just uh, got a confirmation yesterday that I'm going to be able to go to the US on a, on a US visa, um, which the only reason I mentioned that is because um, the type of visa I applied for is the, the O1, which is uh, where you, you say you're an expert in your field. Um, and I actually was able to convince them that Bitcoin was an important enough field um, to go to the US on a visa for it. <laughs> So, uh, you know, looking back, like imagining when Bitcoin was a tiny project with like 100 people who knew about it and, you know, just geeks talking online and it, nobody thought that it could ever have any particular value or, or go anywhere, really. Um, you have to look back and you have to say, how did we get here? Um, and I think that I have to identify sort of two major um, bumps where Bitcoin really picked up um, and that was in 2011. Um, and then again, uh, this year, 2013. Um, what happened in 2011 was um, largely uh, driven through like, sensationalist uh, reporting about uh, sort of the dark aspects of Bitcoin, so the drug trade and um, the money laundering possibilities and so on. There was a bit of a media hype going around. Um, but interestingly enough, even though the reporting was negative, um, people still got interested in it and learned about it and found out about it. Um, we got tons of traffic to We Use Coins. We got uh, two million people watching our video. Um, so the word got out there anyway. So the lesson I took away from that is that, you know, despite the way that the media often presents things, people still sort of get the message ultimately if you explain it right. Um, and what is the big benefit? Like, what is ultimately behind Bitcoin's success? Um, and I thought about a, a lot about this. And um, if I had to condense it down to one word, I would say it's predictability. Um, and what I mean by that is that rather than having sort of someone in charge, rather than having someone set the rules as they go along, um, all the rules are agreed upon up front. Um, and if you change the rules, essentially you're creating a new network and then people might switch to it, but ultimately it's their decision if they want to join the new network or stay with the current one. Um, and that's a very interesting premise because out of predictability you get a certain economic fairness um, and you get a uh, certain security and also uh, a certain reliability. <laughs> And uh, the question is, why is that not how Bitcoin was received? Why do you not read articles that is this new, uh, super predictable, super reliable, super fair currency? But wh wh why did people write about it in a different way? Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that um, this kind of predictability is also scary because what if something bad happens and the rules that are in place don't really address that? Um, and it's a fair point, but I think that um, on the balance, uh, this predictability, especially as Tour mentioned in, in the situation where we're in now, where um, the existing financial system it has all kinds of problems with, associated with it, uh, this predictability actually outweighs um, the costs that, that are associated with it. Um, and that's, I think, why uh, so many people are interested in Bitcoin and getting into it. Um, so what can we do as a community? What can Bitcoin do to progress from here? Um, and it's interesting, if you look at um, the conferences back in 2011 in Prague and the one just this year, just a few months, just last month um, in um, San Jose, I listened to the talks and I, I thought that a lot of the talks were actually similar. So there were a lot of people saying a lot of the same things. And I, it got me thinking, like, are we just treading water? Are we just like, you know, just you know, new people coming into the community, but ultimately nothing moves forward? And I don't think that's the case. Um, I think that what we have to work on is usability. Um, namely, the client is still too hard to use, but there are better ones coming out now. Um, we need to work on user expectations, um, specifically with um, the way that people handle their money. Uh, for example, I lost uh, 7,000 Bitcoins due to a bad backup, which, <laughs> yeah, some of you know the price apparently. Um, so. Uh, th these are things that people just don't expect. Like you, you don't lose access to your bank account. It doesn't happen. It's still something that we need to manage the expectations and at the same time improve the solutions. And the third thing I wrote down um, is that obviously we need to integrate with the existing financial system because that's what people use. Um, and this is going to be a big challenge. 
Um, and I don't think it's just a challenge because um, the existing financial institutions are weary of Bitcoin and uh, perhaps a bit cautious about integrating with it, but also because um, there's a risk management issue. Um, the way most finance works is that um, most transactions are so somewhat reversible. Uh, so if there's fraud, you can often get the money back, you can often uh, return the money to the original owner, or you can go after the institution where the money ended up, and if they have a lot of fraud, they might get excluded from the network. But with Bitcoin, the network is designed to be open from the start, and all transactions have to be reversible. Um, you can get around it to some extent, but fundamentally, um, there's this, this issue with, with reversibility. Um, and so what you need is at the, at the connection point, I and mean, this problem is not new, like for example, for remittance, you have a similar problem. There's a company in the US called Zoom, which is a pretty successful startup, just uh, did an IPO, I believe. Um, and uh, they have the same issue, and they have huge amounts of ACH fraud because ACH is pretty much reversible, but their remittance you know, is in cash, so people just take the cash and walk away, and then the transfer gets rolled back, and then Zoom is out the money. So um, this is not a new problem, but it's a problem that every Bitcoin exchange has to face, um, any, and anyone trading Bitcoins. So, we need better solutions for that, and risk management, like I said, it, it, it's sort of a moving target. You have to get better solutions. You won't find you know, the one perfect solution that just completely, completely eliminates fraud. Um, but those are sort of the, some of the things that we want to work on. So I, I think that's, those are the things that you should look for in, in Bitcoin startups uh, to see if they address them, because I think that's where the real need is. Um, so regarding my own company, um, the company uh, I joined uh, last year, um, it's called Ripple. Um, it's also a decentralized network. Um, it's set up as a um, decentralized open source sort of exchange. Um, it's a different technology. It's not a fork of Bitcoin. It's um, different in many ways. For example, um, we, we close blocks. We call them ledgers uh, as soon as we can. So the blocks for us move forward pretty much every few seconds. So transactions confirm very quickly. Um, it also, it allows you to issue your own currencies. So for example, if you're a bank and you take in US dollar deposits, you can issue US, dollar, US dollars on the Ripple network and people can use, uh, send those around and trade those. Um, and a lot of people wonder sort of how does Ripple fit in with the rest of the Bitcoin ecosystem? Is it a competitor? Is it complementary? Um, and the way I look at it is that Bitcoin is a payment network, whereas Ripple is really intended as um, something that connects different payment networks together. Um, Ripple, sorry, Bitcoin is a, is a currency, and I see Ripple as something that lets you exchange different currencies for one another. Um, so I think that um, the role that Ripple can play potentially is to sit in between financial institutions and uh, Bitcoin and sort of um, be less scary for financial institutions to interact with, and at the same time be really compatible to, for people to interact with Bitcoin as well. Um, we're actually launching a feature today. Um, this is an exclusive announcement, I guess. Um, where uh, dire directly from the Ripple client, you can enter a Bitcoin address um, and you can type in a Bitcoin amount and they'll send that out into the Bitcoin network. Um, so that's something that basically every Ripple user now is automatically a Bitcoin user. They can just pay at any Bitcoin merchant. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, so regarding Bitcoin's future, I think that uh, it's extremely bright. Um, I won't repeat everything that Tour just said, but uh, uh, I totally agree. Um, and the next stage of Bitcoin's growth, I think, is going to be driven by the big Bitcoin startups, the, the good ideas, uh, the good entrepreneurs that, that can make that happen. So I'm very excited for this conference, and I, I hope you enjoy it.